petitions that come on a bended knee and say, oh please, Mr. Powerful, please do me a favor because I ask so nicely. And then there are petitions that come with a power fist. And I want to tell you about a petition with a power fist. You can find it at greenshadowcabinet.us. You can find it other places as well, but that's one place where you'll definitely find it. Greenshadowcabinet.us. It's a very simple petition. It says, we, the undersigned, hereby pledge that if you vote to send us to war in Syria, we promise that we will not vo vote for you in your next re-election campaign. We will do our best to unseat you if you send us to war. That's what they understand, not a pledge of allegiance to the Democratic Party. We must challenge. And it's important to remember there's more than one way to win an election. If we are confined to two parties, and those are the only choices, and it gets harder and harder to find the difference between them. And can I just make sure that the record is clear on that? On Wall Street bailouts, you know, it was 700 billion under George Bush, but it's countless trillions under Barack Obama, and counting 85 billion every month that the Obama administration continues to bail out the big banks with. We should be bailing out our students, not the banks that got us into this mess. On the, on the offshoring of our jobs and declining wages, because mean wages are continuing to go down, that has everything to do with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, NAFTA, these other free trade agreements. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership is NAFTA on steroids. These have all been brought to us by what? Republican presidents? No. By Democratic presidents, starting with Bill Clinton, vastly expanded by Barack Obama, and then massively expanded because the Trans-Pacific Partnership is not just about manufacturing corporations. It's also about pharmaceutical companies, and it is about banks and financial services. And what it does is say that you and me no longer have the power of democracy to pass laws and regulations to create the kind of community and country we want. Under the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we can be sued to the teeth by any multinational corporation for protecting workers' rights, for protecting the environment, for the Clean Air Act, for the Clean Water Act, for the Endangered Species Act, for workers' rights, for the right to unionize, for safe workplaces. We can be sued for lost future profits by multinational corporations that the Trans-Pacific Partnership goes through. And what the Obama White House is trying to do is to do that in secret. Right now they are trying to pass what's called fast track authority. That means it doesn't get debated and we don't get to find out about it. We have stopped 14 of these abusive free trade agreements. Free if you're a corporation, devastating if you're a human being. We have stopped them time and time again simply by shining the light of day on them. That's what we're going to do. If you don't know about it, go to a website, a memorable name, Flush the TPP. Yeah. And make sure they're having Twitter Tuesdays, by the way, which you can participate in, and other ways that you can also not lobby your congressmen and women, but instruct them. As our representatives instruct them, we hereby tell them they dare not betray us by passing this law which places multinational corporations above our democracy and our future. So we're going to stop the TPP in the same way that we are going to stop this war in Syria. Yeah. Yeah. A couple other quick points. You know, one is that we've had this success, at least an interim success, much against everything that 
the Democratic and Republican leadership could do. They tried to ram us into this war. And it was thanks to John Kerry's bumbling Mr. Magoo comments where he mistakenly had a moment of honesty and said there was actually a way that war could be averted. And the moment those words passed his lips, he had to say, oh, no, no, but that could never happen. Forget that I said that, please, in so many words. But the Russians actually took him up on it, and then the Syrians, you know, it was international diplomacy was that dead that a sarcastic comment by John Kerry could absolutely, you know, turn the situation on its head. And we can't stop here because it's much bigger than chemical weapons. The issue here is much bigger than chemical weapons. And chemical weapons are indeed a horrible, heinous, inhuman thing. And the administration of Assad, you know, has blood all over it. But so do many other administrations and many that we have collaborated with and looked the other way upon. Uh -huh. So there's much more going on here than, than uh, punishing Assad and the U.S. as the biggest purveyor of weapons of mass destruction, Yay! starting with the nuclear bomb and going to napalm and white phosphorus and depleted uranium and so on. Uh, we, you know, we're hardly have the moral authority here to be, uh, you know, saying that we have the right to unilaterally attack another nation for using chemical weapons. We do not have the right. In fact, no one has the right to unilaterally attack anyone except in the matter of self-defense. So there, there are our fearless leaders talking about defending, you know, international norms while they attempt to violate international law and become a rogue state ourselves by starting such a war. So it's really important we keep pushing, not only for to disarm the Syrians, we need a disarmament policy in the Middle East. We need a mass weapons of destruction free Middle East and we need to stop the flow of arms into the Middle East. And beyond, of course, but let's start there. I want to say a quick word also about the power that we have. As Alice Walker says famously, many people might know this quote, to paraphrase her, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. What just happened around Syria, I think, is it's not an aberration. It's just suddenly that the reality of power was able to break through. People oppose this war. They oppose the bloated military. They oppose an economy that works for Wall Street, but not for everyday people. By large majorities, people feel that we have a right to health care as a human right. Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. People feel that we have a right to jobs as a human right. Yes. People actually say that in this day and age in polls. People say everyone has a right to a job and if the private sector won't provide it, the government should ensure that everyone has a job at a decent wage. And everyone has a right to a real education, not a dumbed-down teaching to a test, yes. but to a real education that teaches to the whole student for lifetime learning. And that includes a free education from pre-kindergarten through and including college. Yeah. Yeah. We know it pays for itself. We know that from the GI Bill. Every dollar we put in was repaid seven to one. So this is not only the just thing to do and the right thing to do, it's also the practical thing to do. It pays for itself in a heartbeat. 
One other thing I want to mention that pays for itself, and that is a Green New Deal. We can put everyone back to work right now in a job that doesn't pollute your water and pollute your air and contaminate your land and your food supply. By moving to a green economy now, we can actually put everyone to work and put a halt to climate change. The studies show, how many believe climate change is happening? I would think so. All right. If you don't believe it, you're on somebody's payroll. That's the only rational reason out there for people not to believe in climate change. The scientific community is not debating climate change. What are they debating? They're debating how long exactly, how long until we've gone over the cliff and civilization is no longer possible. And that debate now is somewhere between the years 2050 and 2100. How many plan to be here in 2050? How many have kids or nieces or nephews or grandchildren who will be here in 2050? So the debate to have right now is not what our political leaders are still doing. Do they dare talk about climate change? The debate right now is how do we get moving with all possible speed right now so that we put an end to climate change for once and for all and we do it as quickly as humanly possible. When we, when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, it didn't take long to move the economy into a war footing. It happened overnight and we converted our car factories into bomber factories. Well, now we have a new kind of war. It's a war against climate change. It's a war for our survival. It's a war that unifies us across the planet. And we need to start converting the bomber factories into solar factories and wind tower factories and geothermal factories. People should not be bribed, working people should not be bribed into thinking that they have to take a fracking job or a nuclear power or a coal job because it's the only job out there. We can have far more jobs creating that green economy. And here's the really, really cool thing. I don't know if people have heard about what happened when the oil pipeline went down in Cuba in the early 1990s. And this happened because of the breakup of the Soviet Union. So all of a sudden there wasn't any more energy coming to Cuba. And overnight they had to convert to a green economy because if they didn't they were going to starve. So their economy is crashing but they get out the draft animals and they put everybody to work and they get out their bicycles and their public transportation. And what do you think happened to their health? Better. Their economy is crashing, right? You know, which is a terrible, stressful thing. But here's what happened to their health. Obesity rates went down 15, 50%. <laughs> Death rates from diabetes went down 50%. Death rates from heart attacks and strokes went down 20 to 35 percent. And how much did it cost them? Zero dollars. In this country, we spend almost three trillion dollars every year, and we can't come close to that. We just get sicker all the time and broker all the time in our sick care system. But there, in Cuba, by moving to a green economy alone, their health care system stayed pretty much the same. It's a great health care system, but that didn't change. What changed was suddenly the air got clean, people moved to a public and active transportation system, and they started eating a healthy, green, largely plant-based diet. And boy, did they get healthy in a hurry.